Okay, welcome to Real Time Programming, week four. Uh, for um, any people in the future or not in the class, week three was a public holiday, so that is why these videos might be. Um, uh, that's why week three is missing in this video series. So, um, today in class we looked at uh, chops and dats, um, ways to work with data in Touch Designer, ways to add interactivity and, uh, and bring in all sorts of things like web pages, uh, joysticks, um, anything that has numbers or text that we can then do things with. Um, so as a way of um, working through some of these concepts, what we're going to do is um, build off actually a project that came across my desk this week um, where I've been asked to make some um, video to accompany a performance and the uh, video is text um, based on uh, Alice in Wonderland. So, this is a scene where the caterpillar is talking to Alice and uh, out of the caterpillar's um, pipe, or in this case uh, bass clarinet, comes text. Um, so what we're going to be building is something that will read in some text and then will give us uh, some ways to trigger that text and animate it so it's sort of smoky and wobbly and stuff and that will fade away and then on our next cue It'll give us the next piece of text and animate it, and then that'll fade away. Um, and that's what we're going to build. So, um, rather than using this text, is use Jabberwocky. Um, so, if you Google Jabberwocky, you'll be able to find the text somewhere. Um, here is the uh, poem by Lewis Carroll, Jabberwocky. Um, if you have not read this, then uh, rather than going through it here, I'm just going to say go and uh, read it. Um, cool, so I've copied this all... Have I? No, let's copy this. Jump back into touch. And create a new project. Okay, we've got a new project. First thing we're going to do is save it. So let's go file, save as. Desktop, let's save this in a new folder called Jabberwocky, and the project will be called Jabberwocky. Great. Um, and uh, first thing we're going to do is get our content into touch. Now, in this case, we're just copying this text, so I've selected it, copied it, and uh, we're going to paste it straight into a dat. But um, remember that uh, this content could be coming from anywhere. You could be, say, scraping a Twitter feed um, or a web page, pulling in an RSS feed, uh, reading SMS, OSC messages from another system, absolutely anything. Um, in this case, we're just pasting something from the internet. So I'm going to go to dat, add a text to that, dat. I'm going to set it to active and paste my content. Great. Um, now, there are a couple of formatting things just because of the way Touch deals with um, text, so it hasn't recognized some of these characters, but uh, we'll fix that later. We won't worry about that right now. So, we've got our text in a text field. What we want to do is break out each of these paragraphs into uh, sort of a chunk that we can use because what we're going to want to do is display one paragraph. Um, and then on our queue, display the next paragraph and then the next one and the next one. So we want some control over this. So what we're going to do is take our text stat, we're going to turn it into a table. So to convert a text stat into a table, we need to use the convert dat. So this has just taken our um, text and let's put it into a table. So one line per row. And you can see we've got sort of four lines and then a blank line, then four lines and a blank line. You can remove blank lines. Um, we're going to leave them in for the moment. And you can also split at cells. So what this means is, um, what this is saying is it's going to split into columns anywhere there's a tab. We don't have any tabs in this as far as I can tell. 
Um, but uh, for example, if we make this a comma, notice now every time, so it was a really good comma. Now every time there was a comma, it's now split that into a cell. So depending how your data is formatted, um, this is a way you can sort of pass out text into a table. Um, and the reason uh, there was this sort of uh, arrangement here with a slash and then, or a backslash and then a T, this is sort of shorthand for tab. Um, this slash here is called an escape character. So sometimes you might um, uh, want to specify like a forward slash, for example, or some other character. Um, and if you didn't use this escape character, uh, things could get confused down the line. So this is a convention that pops up in a lot of um, in a lot of programming languages. I believe you can go uh, slash space, and uh, now it is splitting into cells everywhere there's a space. So this way you can break things, break your cells into words if you wanted to do that. Um, so notice this is slash space. You might be able to do it with just space. Yeah, you can just put a space in there and it does it as well. We don't want to do that at all, we just, this is good, this is how we want. Okay, um, next thing's next, let's, we want to break this into sort of chunks of four uh, rows. So, we're going to use the select that to do that, make a select that. Cool. The select that will let us select rows, select columns, um, if it's disconnected, you can also specify a DAT. So this is a way that you can pull a DAT from one place in your network to another place in your network. In this case, we're just going to wire it in, and we want to select a group of uh, rows. So let's say select rows by index, and uh, by default, what it's doing is it's selecting row 0 to 33. Now row 33 is the last row in our um, table and there's a little bit of Python in here by default this little uh, bit of code here is telling um, is uh, resolving down to being the last row in the DAT so if you had a different size DAT this number would always be the number of rows in your DAT um, we're going to be a little bit tricky here. So what I want, actually want to do is start from zero and then um, go to three, and then I want to be able to offset that amount. So I want to say uh, I want rows zero to three, and then I want rows five to eight, and then I want rows 10 to 13. Um, and the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to use my start row index as my automatable parameter, and uh, my I'm going to make it so my end row index is always four rows below my start row index. So this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to right click on my start row index and say copy parameter. And now I'm going to right click on my end row index and say paste uh, reference. Now what this has done is it's put in the Python that points to this parameter. So you'll notice as I move my start row index, it starts, it moves my end row index. And what that means is we're selecting one single line out of this um, at a time, which is a start, but not what we want. We want to select four lines. So I'm going to go to my in, end row index and pop this out. And I'm gonna just change this number by adding three. So taken the Python that it's given me, and then I've said plus three. And now you'll notice if my start row index is zero, zero plus three, my end row is three. And as my start row index goes up, so does my end row index. So now I'm going through this four lines at a time. And we can jump through paragraphs by specifying the start row that we want to go to. So here we're going 0, then the next one we want is 5, and then the next one we want is 10. So we've got 0, and we've got 5. Notice that's our next paragraph. Next one is 10. There's our next paragraph. 
So this way we can uh, select those paragraphs. Great. Um, that is what we're going to want. So I'm going to plump a null down, ready to use that text. So we'll export that later. But this is a uh, that's our little text input bit done. Now we want a way to control our start row index so that we can jump through those parameters. We're going to use a um, button to do this. So we're going to do, I don't think we've used a button yet. So uh, let's have a look at that. We'll go to the comp and we'll put down a button. Buttons are containers. Um, you can set them to active and clip them. They've got some options up here. We'll get to those options in a second. But because they're containers, we can go inside them and we can actually uh, edit what's going on. Um, the one thing that we're going to want to edit first is here in our BG, um, or this is a top, so this is just a regular text top. Um, and the uh, parameter text is what's defining the label of our button. We're going to call this next. So this is the button that we're going to press to go to our next paragraph. Cool. Let's plug in a trail and have a look at what it's doing. So we had a look at the trail drop in class. Remember, trails are just a good way to inspect data. So this gives you what the chop has been doing over the last four seconds. Um, if I set my button to active, I can now click it. And you can see it goes to 1. And if I click it again, it goes to zero. One, zero, one, zero. This is what's called a momentary button. Um, momentary buttons are sort of like light switches. If you want to be able to toggle something on and off, then you want to use a, oh, sorry. This isn't a momentary button. This is a toggle button. Um, so if you want to toggle something on and off, then you need to use a toggle button. What we want is a momentary button. So a momentary button is more like a key on a keyboard. So you press it and uh, you let go, and it is only on for the time that you press it. So in our button, in our button parameters, you know, uh, on our first tab button, there is a parameter called button type. We want to pick momentary, and now if we uh, set it to active and click it again, notice it is only one for the time that I'm holding it. Click and it always returns to zero, which is what we want. So we're going to use that as our input to uh, move oops, uh, to move between um, paragraphs. Great. I don't need my trail anymore. I'm going to get rid of that. Um, cool. Now we're going to want... Uh, so at the moment our button just puts out ones and zeros. We want to be able to sort of count how many times we've pressed this button and increment a value um, dependent on that. And uh, the, the chop that we can use to do that is the count chop. If I drop this here and connect my button, I'll set my button to active so I can interact with it. If I click my button, notice the value is now one, click the button again, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it is counting the um, number of times that I've hit this button. Um, in the count tab, you can reset it. Um, we'll put a button, we might put a button in here later to reset it as well, but for the moment we'll just do it manually. Great. So now we're counting. And we can use this value to select to the row that we want to select. So I'm going to um, drop down a null that I can export from. And I'm going to set this to active. I'm going to choose my select dat and I'm going to click and drag my um, active null over to my start row index. So I'm going to export this value to my start row index. So I click and drag, let go, I'm going to say export chop. And now uh, every time I hit this button, you can see we're going up a line in the um, point. Cool. Um, that is fine. Let's just up reset our count. Um, that's fine, but we don't want to go up one line every time. We want to go up uh, five lines, right? If we have a look at our, um, our poem here and our convert, you can see first we want zero, then we want five, 
then we want 10, so we want to go up 5 every time. The way we can do that is with a, a math chop, the ever useful math chop. So I'm going to insert a math chop after my count. And uh, in the multi add tab, there is a multiply option. Let's multiply this by 5. So now when my count is 5, um, sorry, when my count is 0, 0 times 5 is 0. And if we click this, now my count is 1, and 1 times 5 is 5. So we're now selecting 5 from our DAT. If I click it again, my count is 2, and 2 times 5 is 10, so now we're selecting row 10. So we got it. If we click this, you can see we're jumping through um, paragraphs, which is exactly what we want. Great. Let's uh, reset. Okay. Um, now, we're going to be clicking through this quite a bit, so um, I'm going to uh, add a reset button by copying this button. So uh, I've selected my button, I've gone Control c Control v and this um, second inlet on our count chop is a reset. So I'm going to plug this in here. I'm going to set both my buttons to active. You can do that uh, simply by box selecting and then clicking active, and they both go active. And you can see I can go next, 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 and count up. Then if I hit this new button, it resets back to zero, which is great. Um, it is a little bit confusing though, because they both say next. So let's go into button two and rename this to start. Come back out, now we've got a start button and a next button. We can go next, 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 all the way through our phone. And then once it gets to the end, we can start again. Okay. Um, okay, so we've got the beginnings of our um, interaction. And we've got our data into our project. Now we want to start um, the aesthetic side of it making this uh, look like something other than a table of data. So um, we are going to want to render this text and we can do that with the render top. Oh, sorry, the text top. Um, text. Okay, here's my text top. By default it says derivative. I'll hit P to bring up its um, parameters and I'm going to drag my null over to this adapt option or this adapt field and uh, I'm going to turn on word wrap and I'm also going to get rid of uh, the text derivative because whatever you put here will be um, uh, propended to the beginning of your DAT. So let's delete this. Um, and let's go, let's get this resolution a bit bigger. So we'll go to common. Let's set this to, um, I'm just going to go 1280 by 720, but you could do um, anything you want. I'm just going to do it not so high resolution to uh, keep my computer from catching my fire. Um, okay. Now we've only got one line here. Instead of sending um, our text top a dat, um, like a table dat, let's send it a text dat. So at the moment it's picking out this one um, row from our, um, from our table. We want to make this just a chunk of text. Um, to make this a little easier to see, first I'm going to drop down a null. This is a null top. I'm going to connect my text to my null top, so this is going to be the end of my chain, and I'm just going to set it to display so it's in the background of our network. Okay, so you can see we're getting the first line out of our DAT here. I'm going to right click on my wire in between my select and my null. Insert operator, let's insert um, a convert. Great, so just like here, where we took our text, converted it into a table, 
um, we're going to convert it back into text. So where it says how, let's say to text. So now we've taken our um, input as text, we've turned it into a table, we've selected some lines out of it and given, our way, uh, given ourselves a way of controlling which lines we select. We've turned it back into text and now we're exporting that through a null to our text top and uh, turning it into a texture. And this resolution seems a bit funny. Oop. 1280 by 720. Don't feel like I'm firing on all cylinders. Okay. Great. Exercise your creative side a little bit and maybe uh, pick a nice font. Um, cool. This is the one I used for the other project. So it's over. I'm going to increase the font size so we can uh, see it a little bit more. Let's go up to like uh, 60. Uh, bit big. Let's go down to 45. Okay, cool. Okay, that'll work. Cool, and we can we can try this now, right? Let's go over to our control. Click next. There's our next um, paragraph. There's our next paragraph. There's our next paragraph. All the way through until it's. Uh, finished, and then we can click start, and we're back to the beginning. Great. Of course, we've put buttons here, but this input could be anything, right? This could be on a timer, you could be uh, pulling information in from a connect, so people would, you know, swipe their hand in the air and go to the next uh, paragraph. Um, could be anything you want. Um, okay, we've got our text. Um, let's stylize this a little bit. Now, uh, I'm going to go with the same approach to the, to, um, the project that I'm basing this on. So we're going to try and make this sort of smoky text that's sort of floating around the place and sort of disperse into the air. That's, that's what we're going to go for. First we want to give it a bit of life, so we want to animate it. Um, the way we're going to animate it is using the displace top. The displace top will let us um, take any particular pixel and push it left, right, up or down depending on another input. And we're going to use noise to drive our displace top. Um, first things first, let's insert a displace top. So I'm right clicking on that Y insert operator. Let's insert a displace. And it's giving us an error. That error is not enough sources specified, and that's because we're not giving it anything to displace this with. Um, so we're going to want to create a noise top. Um, and we can just plug this straight in. And you can see our text is completely scrambled. Um, if we go to our displace top and bring up its parameters, um, what we are looking for is displace weight. Um, I'm actually going to click on the parameter, the, the name of the parameter displace right, and weight. I'm going to left click and hold and bring up my evaluator and then I'm going to slowly pull this down. You can see our text sort of comes back. So we can figure out exactly how how displaced we want this. I think we probably want it just a little bit. So we still want to be up here. So 0 0.004 is feeling pretty good to me. Um, now let's go into our noise go to its transform, and as we've done before, we're going to go to its Z parameter, and we're going to uh, uh, use our magic Python, which is seconds, And we've got wiggly text, which is great, but it's a bit fast, so let's uh, pop this parameter out and slow this down. So I'm going to multiply by like by 0 0.1. Okay, that's feeling better. Now we want to start making it feel a bit smoky. Now this is going to be a two-step process. We're going to use noise again, but I also want to uh, blur this um, text. So the first thing I'm going to do is go to Insert Operator and put in a blur after the displace. Uh, 
Um, and you can see it's softened it already, that's good. Get a feeling for how it's working, it's just feeling good. Let's uh, soften it just a little bit. We're going to come back and um, automate this parameter later. At the moment I've set, and the parameter I'm automating is filter size. So at the moment I've just set it to 7, I'll do for the moment. Now, um, we're getting there, we've got sort of soft, solid text, but we want to make this look a little bit smoky. So what we're going to do is actually uh, multiply our text against another noise texture. Um, so let's make another noise. And uh, I'm going to come in here and change its resolution to 1280 by 720. Um, already that's looking fairly smoky, but I think uh, this might not have quite enough detail. We'll have a look in a second. So I'm going to now um, drop down a multiplier and multiply my blur with the noise. Okay, so you can see what's happened with a multiplier is um, what multiply actually does is it goes through each pixel and compares the two videos. And for each pixel, it multiplies that pixel with the pixel in the other image and uh, and spits out the result. So if you think about our text here, uh, just imagine that this checkerboard where the zero alpha is uh, zero and where our text is, is one. Um, so white is one, everything else is zero. The same with our noise. So black is zero, white is one. When you multiply, uh, say, look, if we look at this really good bit, you notice on the R of really here. So our text here is white, that's one. But our um, noise is, at that particular spot, happens to be black. And so one times zero, uh, so the black is zero, so one times zero is zero, and we get a black. Uh, that's the effect of multiply. We want to give this a little bit, I think I want this noise to have a little bit more detail, so I'm going to adjust the harmonics so that this becomes sort of a, a bit more detailed noise. And we also um, want to um, get, put this on a black background now. So go to our text and in colour pick background and we can turn the background alpha up. So now our background text is black. You notice it's looking a little bit funny, and that's, I think, because we've got this moving text, but with this um, still texture slapped on the top of it. So let's animate this noise as well. Um, and we want this to start to look a little bit more like smoke. Smoke tends to rise, so we're going to transform it like we did before, but we're going to transform it both in Y and Z. So I'm going to start with Y. Same trick as before, abs time dot seconds. And I'm going to have a guess here and say times by 0 0.1. Okay. So it's looking better, but this doesn't look like smoke, right? This looks like um, maybe you're flying over the top of a landscape looking down. And that's because even though it's translating upwards, the texture itself is static, and you think of smoke, it's sort of lively and moving. So that's where we want to translate in Z as well. So I'm going to use the same trick. That's not bad, um, but uh, it doesn't really look like it's in floating in a cloud of smoke, right? We need to um, give this some smoke around the text to sell this a little bit more. So. We're going to do the same trick as we did before. We're going to make another noise. Set its resolution. Oops. Um, and we are going to just add it. We're using add to uh, the end of our current channel. Okay, it's a start. Um, we're going to want to animate this again. And uh, I think this is good. We want it to be a bit 
big. This is actually not feeling too bad. Let's um, adjust the uh, period so that it's larger. I want to reduce its amplitude so it's softer because what we want is the smoke in the, is the background smoke to always be behind our text. So we want our text to be brighter than our background smoke. Okay, not bad. Um, transform. Let's do the same thing here. So we're going to say in our transform Z, we're going to say apps time dot seconds. And we're going to times by uh, 0 0.1. Cool. And we want our smoke to rise as well. So we're going to say apps time dot seconds multiplied by uh, 0 0.05. Okay, not bad. So it's smoky-ish, but uh, these hard edges are a bit of a problem. We want this to be sort of presented on a dark background. So what we're going to do is create a, um, a mask to mask out our background smoke and sort of contain our image and compose it really better. So um, we're going to first uh, create a Let's use a circle for this. Um, let's set its resolution. Common, 1280, 720. Now we can start adjusting the circle. Actually, before I start adjusting the circle, I'm going to apply the mask first. So all of the changes that we make here, we can see what sort of effect it's going to have on our output. So, we're going to want to insert, uh, multiply our noise with this circle. So let's create a new multiplier. Hook our noise and our circle up, and then hook our the output of our multiply. Uh, so the connection I want to replace is this one, right? So you can actually hover over your wire to replace it. Um, so it's successfully masking out our smoke because this isn't the effect we want, right? This is looking a bit too much like a moon. Maybe that's what we want. You can go in that direction if you want. Um, in my case, I want to sort of soften the edges. I want to keep this feeling like smoke. So uh, first I'm going to drop its Y radius down. So I'm going to click and hold my left button, bring up my evaluator and slowly bring that down. Okay, that's not bad. And the other thing we want to do is increase its softness. Um, now, by default, the softness goes up to 0.2. We can click on its actual value and push it beyond what the slider gives us. And we get quite a soft result. That's, that's looking better. I'm going to bring my Y down a little bit more. Let's try 0.18. Ooh, and I might bring it down a little bit, so 0 0.35, 36. Cool, not bad. Um, now, uh, this is still looking a little bit sort of circly. Maybe what we can do to give this a little bit more interest is just um, give it a bit of a tilt. It just looks a little bit more uh, organic. So we've, we've essentially got our composition here. Uh, now what we want to do is um, animate it. So this is where the real meat of uh, what we covered in class is, using our um, chops to drive animations. In this case, we're driving animation that's, uh, that's uh, created from data from our dats. Um, we're doing this a little bit already, right, with our next and I start, but uh, we want this to be sort of more dynamic and, and moving. Um, the first thing I want is for my blur to just sort of bob in and out and do its own thing. Um, so I'm going to want it to go from like maybe a value of, uh, let's say like Five, all the way up to 32. Um, there are lots of ways to generate this animation data. We're going to uh, create, create our own animation curve by using a couple of different components and joining them together. 
Now the first component that I'm going to use is an LFO. LFO. And uh, by default, this gives us a range of, uh, z of 1 to minus 1 and just sort of swings back and forth. Um, if I hook a null up to this and uh, export it to my blur, so I'll set my null to active, drag it over to my filter side, and export chop. So we're going between uh, minus one and one, which isn't really doing anything for our filter size because its minimum is one and it is a um, integer. So uh, the decimal points aren't doing anything, but we can use our math, remember? So we'll insert an operator, we're gonna insert a math to change its range. And we'll change its range to the range we want. So let's say um, we wanna go from minus one to one and change that into a range of five 32. And now our um, text is sort of flipping in and out. Eh, not great, right? It's, it doesn't feel very natural. One thing we can do is slow it down. So we'll pull our frequency down. Okay, that's better. That was pulling the frequency down on the LFO. But it's still a little too regular. So we want it to sort of have a, like a pulsing in and out, but we also want it to have a little bit of randomness. So what we're gonna do is add some noise. We're gonna create a noise chop and drop it down and just have a look at the ranges that we're dealing with with noise. See it's still going between minus 0.5 and 0 0.5. It actually fits in the same range as our LFO. So it goes from uh, minus one to one. I'm going to drag this into my math, and now we've got two channels in our math, channel 1 and channel 2. Um, but if we look at our options in our math, in our op tab, we can actually combine our operators. So uh, there's uh, combine channels and combine chops. We want combine chops, and these are all the things that we can do to uh, uh, join these together with minimum, maximum, average, divide. I'm going to try average. I'm going to put a trail after my math just to sort of have a look at what's going on here. Okay, so you can see we're still going up and then down and then up and then down, but it's a little bit wobbly now, which is good. So let's just recap what we did there in that little bit. We made an LFO, and we changed its range to drive a parameter on our blur. Um, and then in order to keep that from looking too uh, sterile and predictable, we added some noise by creating a noise operator um, and then using a math to join those two operators together um, by multiplying their values together. And then we get this output here, which is sort of goes up and down but it does so noisily. And I'm done with this trail, I'm gonna to delete that for the moment. Great. Save, okay. Um, okay, we've got our animation. It's not looking too bad, there are definitely tweaks that we can do, but, uh, but we're getting pretty close. What we want to be able to do now is use this same data source that we're using to pick our text um, to also drive our animation. What I'd like to happen is for the smoke to appear, then the text to appear, and then the smoke to disappear and the text to disappear afterwards. So I want the text to sort of lag behind the smoke a little bit. Um, we'll start by animating the smoke. What we really want is every time we hit this button, we want a value that slowly rises and then holds there for a little bit and fades away. Now, the way to get a value like that, that sort of fades in, holds, and then fades away, is by using, um, if, if you're familiar with um, audio synthesis at all, there's a thing called an ADSR, an attack, sustain, decay, and release, um, or an envelope. Now, the object to get that sort of thing to work in touch is a oh God, what is it? Trigger. Trigger. 
Now, if we look at the parameters of our trigger, we've got attack, sustain, and in here there's decay and release. So this lets us um, turn a pulse into a um, sort of flowing um, envelope that we can use to drive animations in quite a natural way. But let's just come straight out of our next. So here's our next button. Now when we hit this, um, it creates, it doesn't just increment our data, it also creates this trigger rail for us. Uh -huh, great, so let's have a look at some of these settings. In my trigger, I'm going to want this value to rise, so that's our attack length. Um, I'm then going to want it to sustain and then release over a period of time. The amount of time that I want this to take to for the value to rise, let's say, let's have it come up over mm, five seconds. Um, so if I click next now, you notice our value slowly rises over five seconds. And then it does this little weird thing where it fades away. Let's uh, fix the other side of our envelope now. Um, now. Uh, sustain level I want to set to 1 so what I want this to do is to rise up to 1 and then just hold there for a while um, and the amount of time that I want it to hold for is defined here in my minimum sustain length let's say we're going to hold this for 10 seconds and then after we've held that value for 10 seconds we're going to want it to release let's release over 5 seconds so it's going to take 5 seconds to ramp up it's going to sit at 1 10 seconds, then it's going to fade out over 5 seconds. Let's just check that. It comes up over 5 seconds. And then our value is holding, and it's going to hold there for 10 seconds. And then it's going to release for 5 seconds. Um, I'm going to create a null. And uh, this null is what we're going to use to drive our smoke. Um, fading in and fading out. So uh, there are of course a few ways that we can do this. I'm going to do it by driving the color of my mask. So here in my circle mask, at the moment my color is white. If this, uh, and we can actually the easiest thing to adjust might be its alpha. So if I pull this down, notice our smoke fades out, and fades in, fades out, fades in, fades out. So this is what we want to drive. Let's. Uh, use our new null that we created to attached to our trigger, we'll set that to active, we'll drag it over to our fill alpha, export chop. Okay, now if we hit next, in comes our smoke, it's going to sit there for 10 seconds, then after 10 seconds it's going to take 5 seconds to fade out. Um, great, so we're, we're getting somewhere. Of course because we're driving our trigger from our next button, it's when we hit the start button, we're not going to get our smoke, our smoke's not going to appear. Um, so two things we could do, we could merge, we could also use the override chop, which will take the most recent change and send that through. Um, let's do that one. Let's use an override. So override. I'm going to connect both my next button up to my override and my start button up to my override. And uh, just to show you what this does, see if I hit next, I get a blip, if I hit start, I get a blip. Um, so it's not like a merge, where it's not putting these two channels together so you, that you can use them together. It's outputting a single channel, but it's just outputting whatever it saw last. Um, and I'm going to use that override to drive my trigger. So now when I hit start, my trigger um, is affected. In this case, uh, it's holding up at, at 1. Take for 10 seconds and it'll fade out on Q, say right now. And this will now work with both my start button and my next button. But we want our we want to be able to drive our text in the same way. Um, now um, with the text we can think about how we might want this to transition in. There are lots of ways that we can do it. Um, I think I'd like my text to sort of rise up from the bottom and then maybe um, the top sort of fades away and uh, sort of fades back down. Um, what we're actually going to do is uh, use a ramp, just like we're doing here, where we're using a gradient and multiplying our noise. We're going to do the same thing, we're going to use a ramp, and we're going to use that as a mask against our text. 
So first things first, we're going to create our lamp. I'm going to plunk it down here where we can see it. And um, we want this to be a horizontal, oh, sorry, a vertical ramp. Let's just have a look at the phase at the moment. Now you notice there's that hard line there. We can fix that with these settings. So uh, oops, oh, we want to, I think we want a mirror. Now if I change the phase, you can see we go sort of from black to white. Um, the other thing is um, we want a more solid black bit and a more solid white bit. So I'm going to create a few more um, uh, keys up here, a few more handles, just by clicking in the gradients, and I'm going to set uh, this one here to black, I'm going to set this one here to white, and so now we've got this sort of solid white chunk over here, and this solid black chunk over here, so you can see as I fade that through, we get this big white chunk in the middle of the screen, and fade that up, we get this big black chunk in the middle of the screen. I'm also going to increase the period, let's go up to 2, So now we've got sort of an entirely black thing. We can do this and it goes almost entirely white. Close enough. Actually, if we go down below one, we should get there. there go, entirely white. So if we use this as our mask, we can use this to sort of uh, gradually introduce parts of our text. Okay, so we want to go from 0 0.5, black, up to 2.5, white. Let's insert a multiplication top after our text. Operator, multiply. We're going to multiply our ramp and our text together. And we need to make sure that our fixed layer input is 1, so that our resolution remains correct. Um, now if we have a look at what that does, if we go to our ramp parameters, notice there's black down here and white up the top. So as that white comes down, it reveals our text. Now the actual animation source that we're going to use is our trigger, just the same trigger that we're using to drive our smoke. What we can do is use the lag operator after our trigger to have sort of a delayed response. So let's create a lag. Plug this in here. If I hit next, uh, we've got our ramp coming up here, our trigger, but this is this value here is actually a little bit behind it. And uh, the way you can say how far behind it you want it to be is with these two options here, lag. Um, it's in seconds. I'm going to put my text like two whole seconds behind um, my smoke. Um, the reason there's two values is because you can change how slowly the value rises and how slowly it falls, so you can control them separately. That's particularly useful for driving things like um, audio visualizations. If you think about like the EQ bars on the stereo, they'll rise very quickly, almost instantly, and then slowly fall down to give you that fall off effect. Um, similarly, uh, this is cool if you're working with something that say uses like mouse input or some sort of gestural input. If you lag, um, your response behind that input, it gives the sensation of weight to um, whatever you're controlling. So um, lag is very, very useful for creating um, natural, natural interactions. Um, okay, uh, I've got my lag, but let's put in my null so we can export this parameter. And I'm going to set that null to active. I'm going to go to my ramp, and I'm going to drag this over to my phase export chop. Of course this isn't going to work right because it's not the it's not the value that we wanted it to be. We wanted to go from um, 0 0.5 to 2.5 so at the moment this gets to 1 and it's just sort of got the bottom of our ramp here which means we can just see sort of the bottom of our text so we're going to need a math in here as well. We could put our math either before our lag or after our lag um, they might have slightly different effects, uh, or they might be the same. Um, I'll leave that for you to experiment, but in my case I'm going to put it after my lag. And I want to change my range, at the moment it's 0 to 1, I want to change this to 0 0.5 to 
to 2.5. Okay. Let's hit next. In comes my smoke, and then comes my text. Now we should see the smoke disappear first. Then our trigger value starts to drop. There goes our smoke, and then after that goes our text. Let's delay our text a little bit more. But it's feeling pretty good. Let's delay it by like five seconds. Next. In comes our smoke. In comes our text. See our lag still increasing very slowly. Now down comes our smoke. And after that goes our text. Cool. I'm going to push this all out of the way so we can see this and we can have one more go. So let's go start. In comes our smoke. In comes our text. We've still got this question mark here, right? You'd have to go in and edit that text. Um, and of course, some things that we can change here. Uh, one thing that I'd probably look at doing would be adding some bloom. And the way you do that is by uh, taking your output, you blur it, and then you, uh, you uh, combine your blurred image with your dry image. Um, and in this case, because we're working with a black and white image, what we get is sort of a bloom effect that you might have seen in uh, video games. You make things sort of look like they're glowing. Um, other things that I'd probably look at doing, you know, the smoke isn't super convincing. I'd probably want to adjust those um, parameters a little bit so there's a bit more black and a bit more definition. Maybe animate the mask in a bit more of an interesting way. Um, and, uh, yeah, and some of those details on that text as well aren't quite there. Um, just quickly to show you some examples of that, I'm just going to save Jabberwocky and let's open the last one that I did, um, Caterpillar. So I'll hit uh, start. Oops. Um, so uh, some of the details here, right? So the, um, the smoke in the um, text, um, I've sort of fine-tuned that a little bit more my mask on my um, background smoke is the same thing. It's a tilted ellipse, but it's a little bit tighter. And the noise that I'm using to drive the smoke is, has a bit more black in it. It's a little bit more dispersed, and the, uh, the animation is tweaked a little bit more. You might notice the, um, the glowiness that really sort of sells it. That's this bloom, um, bloom effect. So I'll come over to the end of my chain. This is uh, very common, especially in things like uh, video games. So here, I'm, here's my get my original output. I blur it, and then I here I'm multiply. I'm screening it, so I'm taking my original and my blurred, and I'm compositing them together using um, the screen operation. Um, okay, I think I've got to leave it there because uh, both my brain and voice are giving out. Um, but uh, thanks for sticking around. As far as like extending this, um, I think probably one of the more interesting things to explore here would be your text input, uh, finding interesting sources for uh, driving like an interactive text display. Um, I really encourage you to like try and pull in like an RSS feed, maybe try and pass some XML. Um, and uh, of course we, we looked at using OSC in class, so you could also try um, reading in OSC messages and then displaying them in the same way, and maybe recognizing when you see a new message. So um, you get a new OSC message, you could uh, then trigger your animation to show your new OSC message, then fade out and be prepared for the next OSC message. So you don't need to be clicking buttons, sort of this, uh, you know, automatic um, message receiving thing. Um, and uh, other than that, maybe you could go and uh, have a cup of tea with like lemon and honey and uh, that would probably be good for your throat, but I think I'm just saying what I want to do. So um, I'll leave it there and I'll see you either in class or on the internet.